Hello, I'm Michael Barnes. I'm a professor of art in the School of Art and Design at NIU, and I'm a head of the printmaking area and a presidential research scholarship and artistry professor. Um, I'm going to speak today about some of my recent work, a uh, body of work that I, I just concluded after two years of uh, working through, through a series of, of prints. Um, my specialty is in lithography, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of lithography. Um, this is a follow-up a little bit from my lecture I gave at the Art Museum um, two years ago, I believe, or a year and a half ago. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, history of lithography and this guy right here. This is uh, Alo Senefelder, and this is uh, the book that he published on lithography in 17 or 1819. Um, 1818 was the first publication of this. He invented the medium in 1798 in Munich, Germany, and went on to publish um, a treatise on the uh, process in 1818 and patented the process. So uh, stone lithography is, is a little bit over 200 years old. It's been used for commercial purposes. It was invented, uh, Senefelder was a, um, a playwright and actor and he developed, developed lithography as a way to publish his own place. So I'm gonna share my screen and speak a little bit about the history and then go into some of the work that I created and also talk about my experiences working at a residency in Germany, in Munich, Germany for two months um, where I started this body of work that I just wrapped up this year. This is a portrait of Senefelder uh, again, Senefelder was, um, was the inventor of lithography in 1798. He was born in Prague uh, and moved at a young age to Munich, Germany with his family. His father was an actor uh, um, and was a, a member of the uh, Royal Munich uh, Traveling, Traveling uh, Actress Corps, Theater Corps. And Senefelder picked up that profession against his father's wishes. Uh, his father died when he was relatively young uh, his father tried to dissuade him from being an actor because of the, you know, the, the tough life that it entailed and, and the, you know, the chance for success in this field. Senefelder had published a couple of plays and then ran into kind of a brick wall on publishing uh, further, further plays. So he, he started experimenting with print, printing techniques to basically publish his own plays. And, led to the um, invention of lithography. The famous story is that he was, he had a, a, a piece of Bavarian limestone prepared in the studio, which he was using to print from. And his mother came in and asked him to um, pick up some things from the store. And so he wrote the list on the stone in one of the pencils that he prepared. And when he got the stone wet, he noticed that the water uh, rejected, um, the drawing material rejected the water that he put on it. So it, it led to this, um, discovery that water and grease repel one another and led to this planographic printing process. Um, going to Munich was a very exciting experience for me because I, I was able to track some of the um, paths that Sendefelder had followed and visit some of the places where, where he lived and worked. Um, this is the, uh, the central uh, plaza in, in Munich, the Rathaus, the Alt um, Neue Rathaus is the uh, has the uh, glockenspiel, the, the famous clock that has the uh, knights that come out and joust up in the top portion of it, goes off every day at noon and lasts for approximately uh, about 20 minutes or so. And, and these you know, life-size card figures move around in, in, in the clock. Uh, on the right-hand side is the uh, Fraunkirche, the famous church with the onion domes in, in the center of Munich, kind of a landmark. Uh, I visited, I tracked down, I basically was uh, tracked down a lot of the um, statues, uh, all the ones that I could find in places that they, they paid tribute to Senefelder. Um, the uh, statue on the right hand side is a uh, statue outside of the uh, Senefelder Institute for Lithography, which still exists today. Uh, that was established by his son after Senefelder's death. And it's a, a lithography institute that trains um, commercial printers. Uh, so they work with commercial techniques now, but originally they worked with stone lithography. Um, the others are statues in various places around Munich and you know, in the um, Bavarian region. Mm -hmm. 
This is Sonnefelder's grave, which is located in Munich. Um, it's in a small cemetery in the middle of the city. And I was able to visit, visit his um, tombstone, pay tribute to Sonnefelder. Um, these are some of the prints in the, um, the uh, art museum, the print collection that, that Sonnefelder created early on as experiments in color printing. And these are very interesting early, early examples of color printing in the uh, early 1800s, um, really before chromolithography uh, for color printing process was, was developed later on. Um, more in the 1900s is when um, chromolithography was really, really developed and, and fully put to use commercially. Um, so these are very rare examples and also beautiful, uh, beautiful prints. They were printed onto, I believe onto like a felt material and transferred onto paper. Um, and there's, there's probably 15 color layers on each one of these and printed in multiples. So you can see the, uh, the one on the left, the reverse image, the mirror image of the original plate. And then the uh, final print that's been, uh, the top one I believe is the original, um, original platen um, that was used to create the image that's on the bottom transferred on. Um, there's a famous stone cellar in Munich that has a, a collection of litho stones that were used to create maps. Um, they're basically like um, uh, survey plats of properties in Bavaria. And they map out the whole city of Munich as well as the Bavarian region. Um, this was developed for a tax system to tax people based on the land that they occupied. Um, and it was, a lot of it was developed during the, the Napoleon's occupation of Germany during the Napoleonic Wars. Um, they developed very um, elaborate surveying systems. And you can see the image on the right, they actually had a, a, a device on the top of the uh, Fraunkirche, one of the towers that they ran uh, lines from that they used as the center point for all of Bavaria. And they mapped, they mapped out the uh, regions based on this system that they devised from running these lines from the top of the Fraunkirche. It's a very interesting history. Uh, this, this stone cellar has probably, um, I think there's in the neighborhood of like 130,000 stones that are stored in here. Um, and it's declared a historical landmark so they can't just throw the stones away. And they're, they're housed in these, um, most of the stones are about 24 by 24 inches. And they're housed in these racks that are much like a library system. So there's a crank, cranks that will um, push the carriages back and forth um, so the stones can be pulled out. You can see this is a pretty elaborate um, topographical map of the area. And some of the devices, the top one is a table that they put the stone on so they could spin it around. They had a turntable. Uh, bottom right, there's uh, small carts that they would position the stones in so they could wheel them. Uh, from the racks to a printing press. And then the left are just um, stone carts that the stones would be put on to move, move around. And uh, this was a <laughs> one of the people that got trapped in the stone cellar when they, they, pulled, the, they pulled the racks shut. <laughs> um, I was also able to visit the quarries in Sonhofen. So this is the famous uh, quarries that uh, the limestone that's used to uh, produce lithos is, are quarried from. Um, the quarries are still in operation. Uh, today they quarry mostly uh, paving stone for patios and, and um, flooring, uh, but they still quarry lithography stones when they find a region of the uh, quarry or they find a section that has some nice quality uh, darker gray stones. And they cut the stones from um, the larger slabs that they uh, pull out of there. This quarry is famous because in the, um, the uh, formation period of this, this um, area, uh, during the uh, Jurassic uh, Mesoeric era of the Jurassic period, these um, lagoons had had very little disruption. There was very little um, water flow that went through them and currents that would upset the sediment. So the sediment was very pure. And they've, they've actually found some really amazing uh, fossil specimens. Uh, some of the uh, early forms of winged dinosaurs uh, exist in this, from this quarry and quarries in the region. Um, and the, uh, for lithography, the limestone that's used for lithography, it's a very pure limestone. It's uh, like 90, 97 and 98% calcium carbonate of lime. So it has very few impurities in it. Um, 
limestone we find in the Midwest is, is quite often very coarse, very yellow, full of fossils, full of um, impurities. So this limestone that comes from Bavaria is a, is a really beautiful limestone for the use in lithography. Um, so we prepare the stone by graining it and then doing the drawing with a grease pencil. And then the um, stone is processed and taken through a, a few processing steps so that it can be inked up and the ink is then transferred to paper. Uh, but while the stone is wet, the water protects the non-image area so that you can roll ink on just the drawings. Um, so this is a, a giant piece of limestone that they pulled out of the quarry. And there was a whole team of guys back in the day that would uh, do this by hand. And today, most of the work is done with machines, uh, but they would pull out a, a giant uh, slab of limestone and then they would, they would break it down into thinner slabs and then chisel out the pieces within the stone to make, um, to make the finished um, limestone. That, that's used for lithography. So these are stacks of stones. Um, this is the, the warehouse in the back today with all the stacks of litho stones. They still have thousands and thousands of stones. Um, the bigger ones are rare and harder to find. And then the darker gray ones are the really highly prized ones. So you can see the colors of these are really uh, quite gray. These are quite beautiful stones. Uh, this is a finished stone that's been polished. Um, the edges are beveled and the edge, of, the edge of the stone is textured to kind of protect the stone. And you can see there's two different colors here. So a lot of times they will laminate the stone to bring it to a, a proper thickness. Um, if it gets too thin, it can easily break on the printing press. Um, so commercial lithography today is done with plates and photographically and then moving into more digital processes in recent years. Um, so the stone printing process you know, around the um, early, you know, 19, probably 1920s or so, um, stone printing started to get phased out in the commercial realm uh, when photographic and aluminum plates came in. Um, so stone printing is, is really, it was adopted by fine artists to use because you can draw directly on the stone and uh, create prints with, with really beautiful results, uh, much like graphite drawings. So stone lithography is still alive and well today in the fine art realm. Uh, and that's me holding the stone. So. I wanted to take this home with me, but it was hard to get on the airplane. <laughs> a stone that size would probably cost, um, that one there was probably five to $7,000 to buy new. Um, a lot of times you can find stones in shops that people are selling much cheaper than that. Uh, but that's a, a very large stone and very beautiful gray. So that'd be a very expensive stone to purchase. Um, I spent two months at this residency in Munich, which is uh, uh, housed in the Kunstler House. Um, it's right in the, the um, Altostadt, the uh, city center of Munich. Um, it's the old sort of headquarters or hangout for the uh, artists in the town. And it was used, um, they had exhibitions there, they would have uh, events um, in the, you know, during the war, they used the, the cellar as, as um, shelter against bombing. Um, but in the, the cellar, there's actually a, an old kind of clubhouse. There's actually an old wooden bowling alley where the artists would hang out there and drink, drink their Steins beer and bowl with a, like a one lane bowling alley where you set the pins by hand. Um, a lot of, these, uh, a lot of the, the you know, facility today is used for um, the events. They run out, there's a, in the front part, there's a, a pizzeria and there's a courtyard in the middle that they, they use for a lot of different events. So that's how they, they pay the bills, but it's a really beautiful building on the inside. On the bottom left, you can see the uh, Steindruck Munchen. Um, that's where the uh, printing facility is at. And this door in the middle here where these two people are standing uh, is the entrance to the, to the um, print studio. And there's a little apartment off the side and that's where I stayed for two months and uh, used the main studio um, for printing. So I could work all night long if I wanted to. Um, these are some shots, uh, photographs of the uh, studio. Um, the right hand side is a gigantic stone. It's probably about the size of the one that I showed in the earlier picture, maybe bigger, definitely thicker. Um, I didn't get a chance to use that because it would have taken my entire residency to grain and draw on that stone. And I wanted to uh, utilize my time to produce more work. Um, but the uh, one on the left is, is sort of a long view of the main shop. It had these giant windows, so it was really a beautiful space. Um, much, much like many uh, European studios, um, 
it was very, very sim simple. I mean, it was straightforward. There were stones, there was presses um, in the chemistry. Um, a lot of the uh, American shops, we have a lot more um, digital capacity and um, uh, more modern style presses. Um, but I, I like working with this old technology. It still works fantastic. Uh, and there's, there's something that's really beautiful about it. Um, they did have a newer press that's hydraulic that I used um, a good deal. The little green press over in the tucked away on the right hand, uh, left hand side. Um, this uh, table on the top here is where the stones are grained. So a stone is put up on the table and you work with a uh, steel disc and metal grip and you grade the stone. And you can see all these stones that are stored underneath the tables. They had um, you know, hundreds of stones within the studio and then an exhibition area on the walls. Um, you can see many of the stones piled up. So a lot of the presses they used were uh, the German, German style Krause press, which um, it operates pretty much like the American style presses. It has a lever that presses a bar down. So you can see on the bottom one, there's a, a bar mounted in the top assembly that presses down against the stone. And then you crank the bed through the press. So it creates a, a squeegee action. Um, I have a video at, towards the end that I'll show this process. So this is me drawing on the stone. Um, the stone is again prepared with a sanding process. Uh, the edges are uh, treated with a gum arabic solution, which is used to process the stone and desensitize it from further grease application. And then the drawing is done with a grease pencil. So the grease attaches to the stone and lithography um, limestone is the perfect material for this because there's a beautiful neutral balance between the grease elements and the water elements. So it, it maintains the, um, that balance between these two elements very, very beautifully through the printing process and allows you to process and stabilize an image to be printed. Um, these are a couple of stones that I was working on. So I'm gonna talk more about the, uh, the work as I get through this section here, um, but these are what the stones look like as I was working on them. So what I would do is, is prepare, you know, at least two stones at a time. Um, sometimes I had like three going and I'd work back and forth between them so that I could, you know, really kind of build the image up and, and live with it a little bit. So what I did at this residency is I wanted to focus on creating singular, uh, just black and white images. And I wanted to get as many images as done as I could. So this was the first one I created. And a lot of times when I go to another place to work, there's a transition period of learning, learning the layout of the shop, learning, learning the chemistry. Uh, a lot of my research has been based in these uh, traditional processes. And when I go to European uh, studios in particular, they, they have a slightly different way of working with um, lithography than we do in the United States. Uh, we have what uh, a lot of people call the, the Tamarin method. Um, Tamarin was an institute of lithography uh, founded in 1961 in Los Angeles and moved to the uh, University of New Mexico where it's still in existence. And it's a, it's a training facility for uh, fine art lithographers to, to make, make prints with artists, collaboratively with artists and publish prints. Um, so they've really done a lot of uh, research and development of the process. And there's a, a book called the Tamron Book of Lithography, Fine Art Lithography that lays out a lot of the processing steps. So a lot of the uh, US um, institutions teach lithography in this Tamron um, way. However, working in, in studios in Europe, they have the tradition there and they have the studios that have existed for a long time and they, they have their ways of working that are slightly different. Um, many, many aspects of it are the same in principle, um, but they have slightly different inks. They have slight, slightly different ways of processing stones. And I find this very exciting. Now with lithography, there's, there's a lot of elements that come into play when you're making a print. Um, the uh, stone is affected by humidity, it's affected by the climate. So uh, if, it's, if the temperature, if it's really hot, it becomes very difficult to print because the uh, grease of the ink gets soft and can spread out on the stone and cause printing problems. Um, I've worked in a lot of different studios. Um, some of the more challenging ones are studios in places with high altitudes where the water dries out really fast on the stone. You get one pass on the stone and the stone dries. So um, this, this particular print is the first one that I did at this residency where I um, 
it, it's, I call it kind of my, my starting point where I'm learning the layout of the land. And you know, sometimes the first print is, is, is um, a little bit more shaky. Um, I just try to work through something fast to get, get used to things. Um, but this one came out well. Um, I have these two figures that are balancing this ball between them. Um, so there's this like power struggle between them and they're, they're pushing against that ball. And they're also, there's a challenge that they have to hold this ball up and keep it from falling. And below they're holding bags of bones and skull, uh, skulls. So this is a, a piece that I just worked up from some sketches. I would visited the catacombs in France um, shortly before I, I went to Munich. And so I was uh, really intrigued by, you know, these, all these bones that were just piled and arranged um, way deep under the streets of Paris. It was, um, it made you feel very small <laughs> and a bigger sense of reality and existence and a reminder of your, your mortality. <laughs> um, so what I did is I worked up each image and I'm gonna show each one as a black and white and then I'm gonna show it as the final color. So I brought all the prints home, black and white prints. And over the last two years, I've been working on these and developing color layers. So the first um, key layer was printed from a stone and then I worked up color layers with the use of um, hand-drawn films that were uh, used to create photographic plates and aluminum plates. And I added these as layers on top of the, uh, the key stone drawing. So it really took a full two years to finish this, um, but I just finished um, uh, towards the end of the summer, beginning of the school year. And this uh, series of work is, is currently on, ex on exhibit. There's two pieces that are in the NIU Art Museum faculty exhibition. And the whole series is on exhibit in Astoria, Oregon at the uh, Brumfield Gallery. Um, so this was the second image that I created there. I put these in chronological order from when I arrived at the residency and worked through the series. Um, this one deals a little bit with you know, kind of the absurdity of life and the mundane tasks that you're often forced to do as a uh, growing up as a kid in the countryside and uh, living out in the uh, rural areas of Michigan. Uh, a lot of the work that I had during high school and college was to work for farmers and neighbor in the work for uh, some of the neighbors who were farmers and a lot of the jobs they gave me um, in addition to you know, the farming work was just to go out into the fields and pick up rocks, and pull weeds, a lot of the things that they, you know, weeds now they just spray everything so they don't hire people to pull weeds as much but I picked up a lot of rocks as, as a teenager, and you would throw them in the bucket throw them on a wagon take them to the end of the field and dump them in a big pile. Um, so it just seems like a, uh, you know, they had to get the rocks out of the field so they wouldn't damage the heads on the combines or um, damage the uh, farm equipment. Um, so it just seemed like a very, um, you know, mundane kind of a pointless task because you would pick up all these rocks and then the uh, freeze and thaw would come during the winter and spring and more rocks would come to the surface. Every time they plowed the field, more rocks came to the surface. So I think it's just kind of a way of, of summing up, you know, life, you know, you're, you're always going through these, these routines and some of the routines you do are, are kind of, um, mindless and just, um, repetitive. Um, so I, I put boots on this guy's hands. Um, there's a guy up in the tree that's sort of testing, you know, testing his ropes that are attached to who knows what. So uh, the title of this piece is The Trouble with Gravity. So it's it's a little bit about aging. It's a little bit about, um, you know, just life and uh, mortality and, you know, the inevitable, um, you know, aging and, and eventual death of, of all of us. And not to be grim about it, I, I, I see my work as, as sort of a satire on life and, and um, you know, the sort of the human condition. Um, but I, you know, have this kind of pathetic figure that's just kind of trying to pick up these rocks with the boots. So a lot of times I, you know, these pieces feel like self-portraits, you know, I feel like a lot of things that I deal with in life are much like this guy is dealing with. Um, today it's, it's technology, learning new technology that's moving quicker than the speed of light. Um, so this, this is, you know, maybe a portrait of me learning how to, um, do video editing, which we have to do now in our online world. Um, this is a finished piece. So I, I used the color to, um, really go into the background and build up, you know, 
he's just piling the rocks. So they just pile up and keep getting higher and higher. And he just keeps finding more rocks to pick up. So I really use the color to lock the composition in, create a kind of a border, and also really develop the depth of the of the picture. So I've worked I've worked both ways. I've worked with pieces where I I work with singular images or singular figures without a lot of background, more vignettes. Um, then I've worked with these that have a deeper kind of more developed space. So I like working both ways. It's it's I kind of determine when a piece needs something to this level and when it when it needs to be more simplified and sparse. Um, the next piece I worked on, um, you can see the from, from the earlier image, I, I worked on a couple of different pieces at the same time. Um, one of the things that I had a challenge with when I was working in Munich was the, um, you know, it was a little bit drier there. So I had a little bit of printing trouble. So I did this piece as kind of an homage to the uh, um, struggle with lithography. <laughs> it's called uh, decisive action or uh, man, man gegen bear, um, so man versus bear, because um, I felt like the uh, the process you know, during my residency was was fighting me a little bit like a bear, so I was uh, um, at to struggle with it, and um, you know, it was kind of a um, a fun image to do. It, I had it worked up from a couple of sketches that I had these this crazy little. It's, it doesn't really even look like a bear. It's just kind of this crazy little monster creature. And then the guy is you know, taking them on. And this was the finished piece. So I used the, uh, again, I used the photo plate process to um, layer up some textures and colors in the background. Um, I always like the old photographs and old prints that have this deteriorated look to them. Um, the book I showed, the lithography book that I showed earlier, um, some of the, uh, the images are stained up with um, you know, brown, brown spots and uh, foxing within the pages. Um, I like this, I like this aging quality to it. So it's something sometimes I, you know, I try to simulate that and enforce it. Um, this image was, was kind of a collection of some, you know, various, uh, a lot of times when I go to residencies, I like to draw the experience from what's going on around me. Um, so my, my experience in Munich was wonderful. Um, for the most part, I had a great time. I'd go for walks in the uh, English garden every day and I would um, work in the studio. I would walk around the um, Alta Stadt and you know, stop every once in a while to get a mass of beer and you know, relax and maybe eat a pretzel and get some good um, um, bratwurst and some sauerkraut. And, you know, so it's just the, you know, the Bavarian life is, is not bad. Uh, but the, uh, the residency that I was staying in, uh, this is the color version. Um, there was that courtyard I mentioned, and they would have a lot of uh, host. They would have a lot of rented events, um, and they had parties out there. So sometimes they'd go until two in the morning, and they'd have a, you know, it'd be like a disco tech right outside your bedroom window. Um, and then the guys would come around and start cleaning up the courtyard at about five o'clock in the morning. So I would have this experience where I'm sleeping. And all of a sudden, this guy is outside my window with a leaf blower blowing out the courtyard. Uh, so there's a little bit about that. There's a little bit about just sort of my, uh, you know, the guy at the top has his uh, his moss, you know, the liter stein of beer. Uh, the guy at the left there is carrying his lithostone on his back. There's a roller tucked in there. So, you know, this is a little bit autobiographical. And then this big figure has these horns that are kind of blasting out uh, little specks of noise and you know, disturbance. And he's waking this guy up and yanking him out of his blanket right in the early, you know, period of the morning. So um, it was just kind of a fun image. I would just played with a lot of different sketches I had. Um, some of the inspiration for this in the uh, um, uh, Pinatek, um, the uh, Alta Pinatek, the um, museum, uh, art museum in, in Munich that has the uh, old masters. Uh, there's this famous painting by Peter Bruegel, the elder, and it's a, uh, the uh, title of it is um, Das uh, Schlafenland. Um, so it's like the land of um, sloth. You know, so these these figures have been eating too much. They've been eating the pies. They've been eating the you know desserts, and they've all just kind of passed out, and they're laying around sleeping. And you know, so it's kind of about you know this this. Um, land of laziness where these people are becoming too lazy. Um, but that figure in the front there, he has this 
weird staff with the uh, looks looks like some sort of nunchuck weapon. I, I did I wasn't quite sure what it what it was, um, but I, I love this painting. And I went back on Sundays. They had a year old. You know, there's only a year old to get into the museum. So I'd go back and just kind of stand in front of this painting and really uh, soak it up. So Bruegel is one of my favorites, and this was this is one of my favorite Bruegels I've ever seen. And um, it's so that that one, if you go back to the piece, you can see this figure in the um, foreground has that um, you know kind of the that staff, that jointed staff hinge uh, staff laying underneath him. So there's a little homage to Bruegel here. Um, also Bruegel's peasant scenes and kind of the landscape that he creates and the world that he creates. And then um, another old uh, image was uh, this, this one with this guy carrying a litho stone on his back. So this was a, uh, a device that was used to take litho stones out into the landscape. I've never done, I've never ne necessarily done this, but I, I always loved this image, you know, this guy carrying the um, stone out into the landscape to draw on. I just always thought that was a great thing. So the guy up in the left-hand corner has this little stone, which is more like on a nest. Um, so he's kind of nurturing the stone and he has a sponge bowls on his head, litho roller to the side. I think there's a sponge laying out in there someplace to uh, dampen the stone. So a little tribute to lithography, a little tribute to working into the late hours of the night and getting woken up early in the morning <laughs> by leaf blowers. Um, so the next image I worked on was uh, the title of this one is uh, Some Things Are Best Forgotten. Um, this, this worked from a lot of different uh, sketches. So when I, when I go to these residencies, I lay out my sketches on the table and I, I piece things together and I really look through a lot of different sketches I've created over time and some you know current, some that I've had for years and piece them together and, and let them speak to each other. Um, so this one's really about, you know, these figures are kind of, you know, exploring and digging through this landscape. It's, it's something that I've, you know, it's a theme that I've uh, touched on uh, many times in my work, um, kind of the exploration of life and, you know, the, the trials and tribulations and, um, you know, some things best forgotten and it deals with nostalgia. So, so there's, there's some things that are wonderful to revisit in your past, but as with, you know, memory and nostalgia, sometimes the things that you remember very fondly weren't as exciting as they were or weren't as good. Um, sometimes your memory will change them into a better, uh, happier thought than they were uh, originally. So, you know, there's some happy things in there, but there's also the guy in the back is, is, is you know, carrying his bag and, and being eaten by alligators. So, and this is the color version of this one. So, um, it's fun to work these up in color. So the colors are, are created through multiple layers. Um, I start with a warm color, often a very transparent ochre or yellow. And then I'll work through some um, uh, uh, work. I, I typically uh, work in a slightly darker brown to kind of push some of the uh, values in the figures a little bit more. And then I'll, I'll work through a, like a light green sometimes that will be in the background that's ultra transparent and then usually a blue and then a red to kind of finish things off. Sometimes within the figures, I will print color flats that will put some tone in the skin. Otherwise they're kind of gray and zombie-like. Um, while I was there, I took a, a trip out into the uh, Bavarian countryside and visited this town of um, Ubergammerau. And uh, the houses in this town or this little village are painted, it's up in the Alps. And we were on the, the, the way to uh, Schloss Neuschwanstein, which is the castle that was built by Ludwig II, the famous castle that was uh, Disney, Walt Disney based his uh, Disneyland castle on. Um, but when we went through this town, I discovered the image on the right is actually uh, one I pulled off the uh, internet because I didn't have a chance to take a picture of this. Uh, but this was a painting that was on one of the houses in the uh, village and when I saw it, I was really struck by this painting. And, and, um, and when I got back to the residency, I did a little bit of research as to what these animals um, were about. And somebody, somebody on the uh, bus actually talked about that. They're the animals of Bremen. So it's a Brothers Grimm fairy tale that many of you may have heard where the uh, animals leave their farms because the, basically they're all old and they're either gonna get killed by the farmer or they are gonna get sort of put out the pasture or the farmers, you know, 
they kind of collect themselves from they collect themselves from various different little farms and and then they they all decide they're going to Bremen to become town musicians because life in Bremen is better and the animals are treated better. On the way, they find a uh, farmhouse that's being robbed and they look inside the window and the robbers are sitting there indulging in all the food that they've they've confiscated from this house. And so the animals decide they will scare the robbers away and just take over the house. And they stand up on top of each other and they all make their, you know, respective noises and scare the robbers away and the robbers try to come back in the night and the animals attack them and the, so the robbers think the house is haunted has witches in it and the horse you know the donkey kicks him and the dog bites him the cat scratches him and the rooster cackles and you know so they they think there's you know um the ha house is haunted by witches and, and um, demons um, so anyways, this, uh, this image was really striking to me and I, I you know, really uh, started, you know, it's, it's kind of led to a new direction with my work and in investigating um, these fairy tales and some uh, you know, folklore, you know, various, uh, various traditional folklore and the uh, sort of the, the messages they, they tell and, um, you know, proverbs and uh, tales of morality and, you um, you know, so I what I did is I recreated the uh, animals of Bremen, and this uh, image on the right is a little uh, uh, die cast uh, figure that's that I bought at a, a toy store in, in Munich of the animals, and I basically recreated this with my own animals. So they're they're on their way to Bremen, and they decided to, after they scared the robbers away, they decided to stop and have a picnic. So this is my interpretation. Um, I like how the tale sort of addresses the uh, you know that that idea of, of how you encounter things on your path through life um, sometimes you have a goal set out that you're on your way uh, to one particular ideal place and on the way you discover something that um maybe is quite wonderful so the animals after they scared the robbers away moved into this house and lived happily ever after so and i, I really i really like that aspect of the story so these are all this my animals, my weird um, mutated creations. Um, the robbers are kind of off in the background and running away. They have like weird flower heads. Um, I like this little guy on the left is in the swimming pool. So um, we have a pool like this that our dog sits in in the summertime when it's hot. So there's little aspects of my life in sort of stories in it. This piece is called Breaking of the Stones. And um, this has a story as well. These are these are all kind of these crazy nobility kind of figures. So it's um, it, it kind of goes back to some other series that I've done dealing with uh, power and you know how power corrupts and also the absurdity of uh, power struggles sometimes. So they're they're riding these rocks basically, trying to trying to you know tame the rocks like you would tame a, a horse tame a bronco and as i was working on this i had the title in, in my head i actually did one of the sketches i went to berlin for a few days and i did i did one of the uh, sketches like the, the guy on the left was 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 pretty much the sketch that i made the heads were taken from a few different various drawings that i had in my sketchbooks and i just kind of pieced the bodies and such together and developed the image as i went along um, but the working in lithography and stones, the stones are, are, can be rather thin and also fragile. So they do break from time to time. So calling this, you know, titling this print breaking the stones was, was, was a bit of a, a bit of an omen. I have a feeling because this is what happened towards the end of the edition, the stone actually did break. So I was able to get the entire edition, but you can see the top layer of the stone. This was one that was laminated and the adhesive had broken loose between the two layers. And so over you know, time, the stone is you know, well over a hundred years old. Um, over time, the water had seeped into the, uh, you know, the layers between the stones. And as I was printing it, the lamination um, separated and caused a uh, pocket underneath it, which then led to the stone cracking and breaking apart. So the top layer of the stone basically separated. So it was, you know, it, in, in part, it was a tragedy that the stone broke, but in another way, it was, um, you know, 
uh, Franz, who is the uh, studio director, took the stone and mounted it in the kitchen <laughs> and mounted it right to the wall. He glued it back together and, and put the top layer of it, put brackets and mounted it right up on the wall. And typically what they do is they go through and grain all your stones away. So the stones are used over and over and over again. And I always liked the idea of like leaving something in the place that I worked. And, you know, the fact that they were going to go through and grain all my stones off, I was like, well, at least this way I sort of left, you know, left my mark in the shop that will that'll be there forever until they decide to throw the stone away. But the bottom portion of the stone was still very usable. It was still very thick. So the, the top layer was really only about a three quarters of an inch thick. It was very thin. Um, this was actually one of the old stones that I showed earlier from the stone cellars, the Steinkeller. Um, these were the stones that were used to print the maps on. Um, so they'd given a bunch of them to this uh, studio, Steindruck München. So there was, a, you know, there was probably 30 stones in there that were from that collection originally. And then the last image that I finished up with, I was there for eight weeks and my goal was to make eight prints, uh, eight images that I could then take back and finish up. And I, I managed it. So uh, this is just kind of a, this was just kind of a fun piece at the end um, where, you know, kind of paying homage to the English garden and my wanderings and, um, you know, the garden in the summer has a, you know, has a canals that run through it that are branches off from the main river and the water moves very swiftly, very cold. There's a area where they have uh, surfers. Um, they've made a wave in the, in the canal. So the surfers get out there and, and surf back and forth on the wave and line up on either side. They go for a minute or so and then, you know, dump off their boards and swim, you know, go downstream and swim off to the edge and get back and do it again. They go all year round, all pretty much all night long. So every day I would walk over to the English garden and wander through the garden. It was huge. It's it's bigger than uh, Central Park in New York. Um, and there's just lots of strange people laying around, lots of normal people laying around, which is kind of a wonderful um, experience. So I'm just off drawing in the garden on my litho stone. This is me as a little old man, I guess and drawing in the strange plants, yeah, you know, kind of coming up to present themselves. So. so that was a body of work that I created there. And um, I feel very good about it. I was, um, had a lot of fun making these pieces and there's, there's a lot of you know, stories that have kind of evolved from them. And my next body of work, I, you know, I'm really starting to get into um, that idea of uh, investigating the, the folklore and fairy tales. Uh, maybe some of the brothers, starting with the, the Brothers Grimm, um, but, you know, also re, like I did with the Animals of Bremen, reinterpreting um, some of the fairy tales so that I can, you know, bring my own narratives into them. I think that, that makes it more interesting for, for me. Uh, this is a video here I'm going to play just to kind of finish it off. This is how the process is done. So this is the press in Munich that I worked on. This is uh, actually a hydraulic press. Uh, most of the presses I use are hand cranked or um, uh, this one is a hand cranked one, but the hydraulic pressure on the top versus a, uh, a spring system, it's, it's gauged uh, through this hydraulic pump. So it's a very consistent pressure. Um, but this shows you the stone is kept wet and the image is built up as an ink drawing and the ink will reject the water and the water will reject the ink. And off screen, there's an ink slab with a printing roller. And I mentioned it was kind of dry there. So I had to keep the stones pretty wet. And then the ink is an oil-based ink. It's pretty stiff ink and it builds up on the drawing. So you can kind of see from the angle how the water repels off the ink. So the ink lays on the uh, surface of the stone and you build it up through subsequent passes of ink.
So you do this through a, a number of charges. So you have to charge the stone probably like three, sometimes four or five times to build up that ink layer. And then the printing paper is placed on the stone and the pressure from the back. I'm going to run it through the press in a second here. There's a wooden bar up in the middle of the press. That bar is going to press down onto that plastic sheet and apply the pressure that will print the paper, press the paper down into the ink. So there's grease on the top and so that's the hydraulic part. Normally there's just a spring that you pull a bar down. So it's a labor intensive process. You have to um, number one, grain the stone and prepare the stone, do the drawing, take it through the chemical processing steps to stabilize it and then print the addition. So each, each print is printed in um, layers, just repeating these steps. So there you go. That was the morning disturbance. That was how it was printed. So that's my presentation and I hope you enjoyed it. And since we're not doing this live, um, it's hard to take questions, but um, feel free to contact me if you do have any questions. So I appreciate your time.